University. The legislature had, in the 1985 uh, year, established interim study committee to research the question, to review the question. That interim study committee reported back last fall that if there were to be an academy of this type in Indiana, the Ball State uh, had the resources, had done the planning, and was prepared to implement it. That report went back to the General Assembly in the 1986 session last January. We had a very full discussion on the concept. It the bill passed the Senate at one time, and we ended up with the bill not being successful in the Indiana General Assembly in 86. The end result, though, was to establish another interim study committee in the 1986, this period, at which the question would be, how would we fund such an academy? And that's where we stand today as we look forward to the next legislative round. Were the individuals involved in undertaking such a, a program? We've had a wide variety of persons involved in the proposal. Uh, Representative Steve Gabbett has been the author in the House and the legislation along with Dave Cheatham on the Democrat side in the House. Uh, Senator John Sinks, uh, Senator Joe Harrison, along with State Senator Bill McCarty uh, from Anderson and the Muncie area have been the primary people involved in the Senate. Secondarily, we've had uh, people involved like David Hoover from the Muncie area, Representative uh, Hurley Goodall, and State Senator Mike Rogers as well. All right, we have about a 13 or 14 minute tape that will give you an idea of just took what, what took place during that hearing. We're going to watch a portion of that and then when we return, Dr. Koloff and Dr. Perry and I will discuss some of the questions and, and some of the highlights and the um, positive points that will take place. I joined a colleague in authoring legislation to create a school for the state's gifted and talented program. And incidentally, we sure didn't get very far that time. Since that time, my interest in this subject has only intensified. This committee has been asked to look for ways to fund a proposed academy for science, mathematics, and the humanities. This morning, I want to ask you to consider several thoughts as you examine this issue. First, I believe it is appropriate and good public policy for Indiana to give special attention to expanding the intellectual and creative potential of young men and women who can make a significant contribution. Second, as a state policy, it is and should continue to be appropriate to make funding distinctions among different educational needs. We have done this with vocational and special education. Third, as public officials, we should find ways for the state to assist and supplement the work of local schools. The academy is one way to provide leadership in developing approaches and materials that can be used by local schools to enhance student learning. I believe you will find the proposal for an Academy for Science, Mathematics, and the Humanities to be a viable state policy decision. The General Assembly has discussed an approach to this concept offered by Ball State University during the past several sessions. Ball State's proposal is modeled after the North Carolina's successful school for science and mathematics. This proposal has several advantages for North Carolina and for this state. As an aside, let me say that I had the opportunity to visit North Carolina in Raleigh, North Carolina last year, which has been in operation for three or four years. During our tour, we had a chance to visit with students and teachers, and I was very impressed with that visit and what each of them are being able to get from that academy. The North Carolina experience has produced graduates with over 60% of whom are national merit scholars. I think it was 63%. And over 80% of the graduates from that academy remain in their home state to attend college or university. 
The North Carolina Academy is a major impediment to what we all are concerned about, the brain drain. They are keeping their brightest youth in their own home state. Without a doubt, such a result would certainly complement Indiana's own economic development goals and initiatives. A similar Indiana Academy can be established at a cost less than would be true if you started with buildings and support services from the ground. Key elements from which Indiana can benefit are the state's past and current support of operating facilities and extended an extensive library, the investment in computer services, a telecommunication system, and a general lab and special space areas. Rather than duplicate these costs, we should use the state's ex existing resources. The Ball State proposal will take advantage of the opportunity to establish strong linkages between the premier teacher education offered at Ball State University, the State Department of Education, and the public schools. For us to have an impact on education in Indiana, we need to bring these groups together in a working toward common goals. The Academy is one vehicle for doing this. <clears throat> With a nucleus of professionals in this emerging field located at a single site, Indiana can expect to have the leadership and talent base to help local schools in developing and delivering programs. The result will be that all gifted and talented students in the state will be better prepared to contribute. Ball State University became interested in the proposal for the Academy two primary reasons. One, Ball State is a state institution which has a very firm history in the teacher education field. We have a very strong commitment to teacher education. We continue to have that commitment and that interest. And we want to do those things which are helpful to the state and benefit the state in a whole variety of educational areas and policies. In doing that, meet our obligations not only to train the future teachers, but also to provide continuing education opportunities for those in the field and to provide service from the teachers' college and its related units at Ball State. Secondly, we think it's a viable state policy. It has worked in other states. It has added to the educational structure of the states where it has been in existence. We think. It can do the same for the state of Indiana. And as a part of that, we think Ball State University can help bridge the policy effectiveness, bridge the use of existing resources, bridge the mission of teacher education and service to the education field through the use of its current facilities and resources to provide a base for the academy. First, I ask Dean Kowalski to review with you the concept of the academy and Ball State's interest, and then have uh, Dr. Koloff make a presentation. After those two, I'd like to return, if I can, Mr. Chairman, and go through some funding alternatives with you. Good morning. Um, I just want to briefly uh, talk to you about the planning that we've done for this particular program, which has now spanned uh, over three years. We have planned extensively with our faculty and staff in four areas, and we're not going to cover those by any means here this morning. But I tell you this only to let you know that we are prepared to answer questions in any of these areas if, if you wish to raise them. Uh, one of the areas of planning was in curriculum, and we spent a great deal of time, uh, particularly with Dr. Koloff's help, in planning a, an extensive program uh, outline of what we would intend to do for these students if the academy became a reality. The second area of planning where we spent a great deal of time was of course in the area of finances and looking at what such an academy might cost and uh, Dr. Perry is going to talk more about uh, budgets and so forth a little later. The third area which was an area that um, has raised a, a lot of concern and, and questions is the whole area of student life. 
And I want to assure you that we spent a great deal of time giving thought to where these students would be housed on our campus, uh, the kinds of people who would be working with the students uh, to assure that we provided an appropriate environment and one which we hope uh, parents who would, would entrust us with their children would find suitable. And then the fourth area, uh, which is one that uh, we think is the most overlooked area of the academy, is our planning in terms of network and dissemination of all the good things we think we will do in the academy to schools and other agencies throughout the state of Indiana. In that latter regard, I want to quickly share with you a, a project, a research project uh, that we're going to be doing this fall at Ball State University at um, a great deal of expense and time to our college and to the institution as a whole. We are going to be doing a television project at 8 o'clock in the morning starting in the fall semester over IHATS with five high schools across the state of Indiana. Our purpose in doing this is to, to be able to gather data to verify the fact that this kind of instruction can be meaningful and it will be one-way video and two-way audio instruction with teachers in the classrooms in the various high schools and a skilled teacher on the Ball State campus. The Burris Laboratory School will be the home base for uh, presenting this broadcast and the cooperating schools are at Frankfurt High School, Plymouth High School, uh, Anderson Highland High School and Paul Harding High School in Fort Wayne. And so we are spending a great deal of money and our own energy and in looking into ways that we can better serve schools throughout the state of Indiana in terms of dissemination. I mention that because this kind of activity is a major component of the Academy proposal. We believe with the new Center for Information and Communication Sciences on the Ball State campus and the Teachers College and the only K-12 laboratory school uh, remaining in the state of Indiana, we are in an ideal position to provide that kind of service in an area where there is a critical need for improvement of services. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Koloff, who's going to talk a little bit about the need for services for gifted in, in Indiana and how we think we can address those needs. Year after year, our most talented students receive little in their secondary <coughs> education that's appropriate to their needs. And the group which suffers most, of course, is the group with the highest abilities. The Academy incorporates three components which address this situation and offer to the secondary schools in Indiana opportunities to develop and expand their provisions for gifted students. First, the telecommunications project will allow local schools throughout the state to offer high-level courses using the interactive capabilities of the system. Schools which currently do not have enough students to comprise full classes in particularly advanced content areas will use these televised courses to instruct their high ability students. Other schools may not have faculty available to teach advanced courses, so the academy faculty will instruct their most gifted students through the television network. Small schools and rural schools will benefit considerably from the telecommunications component of the academy. A second major component of the outreach program of the Academy is the Outstanding Educator Fellowship. Indiana has many excellent teachers throughout the state, teachers who have years of success in motivating and instructing high school students and who also have exceptional mastery of their disciplines. These individuals have a great deal to offer the Academy students and they have a great deal to learn from working with highly gifted students. Fellowships will be awarded to outstanding teachers, bringing them to the academy for up to one year. There they will have opportunities to teach gifted students, develop and test curricula and instructional materials, materials conduct research related to curriculum and instructional processes, and engage in advanced study. When these teachers return to their local schools, they will bring curricula, teaching materials, and techniques for working with the high, highly gifted students. Programs at the local level will benefit. Finally, Indiana schools and students will benefit from the curriculum development projects of the academy. As courses are developed and taught to academy students, the curricula will be written and disseminated to other schools. We know that few curriculum guides exist for appropriate courses for gifted learners at the secondary level. The Center for Gifted and Talented at Ball State has been developing, 
field testing and disseminating such guides for several years. These guides have been distributed to schools in Indiana and other states. The curricular developments of the Academy will continue to enhance secondary school programs throughout Indiana. Each of the components of the outreach program will contribute significantly to the upgrading of secondary programs for gifted learners in our state. None of the existing residential high schools for gifted students in other states has implemented or proposed outreach to the extent proposed by the Indiana Academy. We expect the impact and benefits of our program to affect high schools everywhere in the state. Thank you. Dr. Kolov, how will the Academy improve Indiana schools? One of the proposals for the Academy is to offer instruction to those schools throughout the state through the telecommunications facilities. So we'll be able to offer courses that are taught to Academy students to students all over the state, uh, no matter how large or small their school is or the availability of their faculty. That's one of the, the ways we'll be helping education all over the state. And then bringing teachers from the schools in the state to the academy through the Outstanding Educator Fellowship Project. Um, we'll have a number of teachers selected yeah, each year to come to the academy, work with students, try out their ideas, and then the uh, teachers will take their ideas back with them to the local schools. Are these fellowships, there will be some fellowships available? That's correct, uh, for the teachers, and that'll pay a stipend and probably support room and board, and, and the teachers then will work in the academy. Okay, now there are going to be so many questions about the selection process, and will there only be Delaware County students um, going to the school? Is it all Indiana? Is it open? How is that selection process going to... This school will be for students who are residents of the state of Indiana and will select uh, about uh, 150 juniors and 150 seniors from throughout the state. It'll be based on test scores. Uh, probably the SAT will be used. Uh, application materials, letters of recommendation, interviews uh, during visits to campus. Um, it'll be very selective school. We're really looking for those kids who are so gifted that they need a very different kind of school program. Also questions are going to come up. It, it, since it will be an elite group and there are those individuals who will assume you must be an upper income family in order to participate in this, that will not be a, a prerequisite. Not at all. Um, as we observed in North Carolina and as other states are attending to the idea of including all segments of the population, of course gifted students are found everywhere in the population and we will be selecting a very balanced group of gifted students based on their educational need and not on any other particular criteria. So fees will be based on on family incomes or will there be scholarships available or? Kelly, let me, let me respond to that. The, the school is elite only in that it's academically elite for, mm -hmm. for talented kids. We find that uh, People who have resources of the upper middle income, uh, upper income classes, probably already have the, those opportunities available for their children. Uh, we think that the academy is more likely to be a service to those in the middle income ranges and lower income ranges who would not have that kind of opportunity. The uh, academy proposal does suggest that we might place some burden on the parent and upon the family to pay the room and board cost. There has been some discussion with the state that that may not be an appropriate state investment. Even the state do the instructional side, room and board may well be the family responsibility. And we're looking for vehicles by which to supplement the family capacity for doing that through using private sector support or community support uh, for those kids who are identified as talented, can benefit from the institution, but who may not have those resources. What about those individuals who live in this area? Would they still be expected to reside within the school? I think our view of the school right now is that all kids who would be a part of the academy would reside because the program is a, is a full life program and it's not one that stops at three o'clock mm -hmm. in the afternoon when the school closes down. What, uh, what sort of figures are we talking about for tuition? Have you gotten it's to that It's really stage? not a tuition charge. It would be a room and board charge. If we were gonna open up the school this fall, we would have to charge for room and board of about $2,300 per student. For the academic year? For the academic year. 
So it is not unlike a, a middle-sized college, perhaps. Um, it's the same figure we would charge a university student who was coming to live with us for a year. Okay. Dr. Perry, what sort of impact would this have on our economy, the Indiana economy? The advantage of the academy, as it has worked in North Carolina particularly, but other states as well, it gives the industry of the state an opportunity to identify the high talent uh, contributors of the future. Mm -hmm. It gives us an opportunity to begin to work with those kids. In North Carolina, they do mentorships with industry research type both during the summer months as well as during the academic. So that part stimulates the economy, but probably more important over the long run is the opportunity to identify these kids, encourage them to stay within the state of Indiana upon completion of high school and college, North Carolina experience, they stay in North Carolina to go to college disproportionately than what they, we thought they were doing. Uh, we think that would help the state of Indiana and over time we would build a, a solid cadre of people uh, that will be available to the industry. Penny, how different would the lives of these children be? Extracurricular activities, um, would it be operated as close to a, a, a normal high school uh, span as possible? That's been an important part of our planning. We will be housing the students together in a living learning facility, but a lot of their classes will take place uh, at the Burris Laboratory School. They'll be interacting with Burroughs students, not only in classes, but in extracurricular activities as well, athletics, field trips, cultural opportunities. Um, we, we intend to have a very full, well-rounded program and not just an academic program. I mentioned to you before the program whether or not the International Baccalaureate program would eventually possibly be one of the benefits of this. Do you see down the road? Uh, the International Baccalaureate is a very popular provision for gifted high school students students. Our curriculum as it's being currently developed is not based on the International Baccalaureate. Which would be using high school credits to perhaps skip even the freshman year of college and, and going right on into your mm -hmm. sophomore junior in, year. Yeah. We anticipate that our students will be able to do that in, in many cases, um, but not specifically through the, the IB program. Tad, is it a reality? I think it's a reality in that the state of Indiana has a lot of good things happening in the public schools or a lot of fine teachers in the high schools, but the stress of trying to accommodate all of the different needs and special needs of kids uh, is somewhat overwhelming. The academy is one and only one of many different alternatives that can help us expand the educational opportunities, do a little better job of uh, stimulating an excellence concept in the public schools. We think the academy can do that and be a resource not only for the 300 kids, that's a fairly small portion mm -hmm. of what the academy will be all about. It gives all the school districts in the state an opportunity to, to use those resources. It gives particularly the smaller school districts that may not have large groups of kids who are talented to draw upon that resource to supplement those kids who want to stay at home and see more or, or wherever else they might be in the state. Uh, but yet, they do have the possibility to extend themselves beyond where they are. Penny, there is has been stated that those states that do have um, programs for gifted children, it's been a result of parental, it's been a result of political and professional initiative. Is that where you see this headed as a, a threefold perhaps? Adventure. It will take the cooperation of all three of those groups to uh, make this possible and of mm -hmm. course all three of those types of groups have been involved in the planning. So of course it will, it will demand from each of those groups. What is the next step at this point? The interim study committee will continue its discussions in September and October to prepare a report which they will submit to the General Assembly in the late autumn. Uh, we'll continue to work with them. Uh, encourage that group to come forth with a recommendation to help us find alternatives for funding it. We still need about a million six of state investment in terms of the instructional side of the academy. Uh, we hope that the interim study committee report will be positive and we will have found a vehicle which we then will uh, put into a legislative format for the 1987 General Assembly to consider. Where does Indiana stand as far as other states in comparison to how we have uh, treated our gifted children. 
It took us quite a while to get started, but I'm really pleased to say that we've caught up quite quickly with the surrounding states. Uh, there was a period of time when we appropriated no money for gifted. Um, we began with little bits of money in the 79 uh, year, and then we, we have, have, thanks to the legislature, been able to increase our support of gifted programs dramatically over the past few years. Are we talking about the students, uh, once this is underway, living on campus at Ball State? They would live in one of the adjacent dorm complexes to what is now the Burris Lab School. So we have a facility which is very close, the proximity is right, it's somewhat removed from the rest of the university's population, which does facilitate, I think, looking at a high school situation. And what is your projected date of, of actually? If the legislature uh, sees fit to endorse the concept and to begin the funding process, it'll take us about three years to go through the full planning cycle for the first year of operation, hire the faculty, the teachers, the administrative staff, recruit the first class of juniors, and then recruit the second class of juniors. It'll take us about 80 990 academic school year before we would be in full operation. All right, so all those seventh and eighth graders right now can start hitting the books if you would like to go to this. That's right. right. Thanks, both of you, for, for informing us on this. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. I'm Kathy Schreckengast. Have a good evening.